It's said to today we celebrate the feast of St. Teresa, Benedict of the Cross. Her given name was Edith Stein. She was born in Breslau, Germany on October 12, 1891. She was born into a large Jewish family who was a very observant Jew. In fact, uh, Edith Stein writes that she would admire her mother's very deep, profound faith. But she was also a very gifted child in terms of uh, academics. She excelled. And uh, ultimately, though, this would lead to her rejecting her faith and becoming an atheist. Uh, you see, Germany at that time was suffering the same thing that our country and many of our public school systems are suffering. Uh, they became seminaries for very left-thinking philosophy, yeah. and very actually nihilism, you know, nothingness, the philosophy of nothingness, and the philosophy of Nietzsche, and all these people they invaded there, and it set Germany up, the most enlightened country in the world, for the horror of it, which would follow uh, the wars and ultimately Nazism. That's what you... She faced, and she was going through education system, she became an atheist. In 1916, she received her doctorate in philosophy uh, from the University of Göttingen, and she had a, she, her dissertation was on Edmund, uh, Edmund Hersera, a phenomenologist. She became a member of the faculty, and she worked with Martin Heidegger, another very famous philosopher, kind of a disciple of Husserl. Uh, and Edith Stein, kind of his assistant, was editing Husserl's writings. She applied for a position, uh, even a very competent, but she didn't get it because she was a woman. Husserl, the very woman who was helping her edit his papers, wouldn't allow her uh, to become a full-fledged faculty member. Well, uh, <clears throat> she did, by the way, that happened both at the University of Freiburg, but also back at her original college or university where she got her doctorate in Gutenberg. But uh, it was during this time that Edith Stein started having some contact with Roman Catholicism. And uh, one summer, or summer reading, she read the autobiography of the mystic St. Teresa of Avila. And that led to a deep, powerful conversion for her. And ultimately she was baptized on January 1st, 1922. <clears throat> she gave up her being an assistant to Husserl, the faculty member, and she went to begin to teach at the Dominican Nun School in Spire. <clears throat> it was there that she began to work on her very deep interest in St. Thomas Aquinas. She translated some of his works, but to see the connect between St. Thomas Aquinas' Thomism and phenomenology, and that became kind of a lifelong work for her. She ultimately would uh, <clears throat> become a Carmelite sister. It's fascinating how God keeps leading this one deeper and deeper. Uh, she was uh, deeply impressed, and she also was impressed with another Carmelite, St. John of the Cross, and began to really work on it. And whole, hence her whole uh, passion for the cross of Christ and the call to suffer. When Nazism broke out, she wrote a letter to the Holy Father, they don't know whether he got it or not, but she absolutely condemned and asked the Holy Father to condemn this horrible movement that was starting in, in Europe. Ultimately, uh, Pius X did come out with a, a pastoral encyclical called the Bernie and Guy, expressing his real horror and, his, uh, and pointing out the abuses of Nazism and <clears throat> how it had broken its concord out with the uh, Vatican. And, uh, Many people criticized that he should have come out harder, but Sister will show the bishops of the Netherlands did come out a few years later very, very publicly, very harsh against Nazism, and Nazism wiped out the whole church in Holland and all the efforts that the church was doing to help the Jewish people escape from the clutches of the Nazis. So said she entered the Discalced uh, uh, Carmelites in 1933. When Nazism broke out, in fear for her life, the Mother Superior sent her to Hollow to be there to get her away from the horror. Well, as you well know, Nazism conquered Holland. She was there, the bishop spoke out. Um, 
very viciously against Nazism, and they went through, and not only did they go out to the Jewish people, they went out to everybody who was a Jewish convert, even to Catholicism. And hence, his sister Teresa Benedictine Cross, her sister Rose, who was also a discalced in Carmelite. They were captured, put on a railroad car, and taken, and they were ultimately uh, executed at the gas chambers. She was <coughs> made a saint of the church on October 11th, 1998, by Pope John Paul II. Interesting enough that uh, the, really the miracle that uh, saved her was the fact that it was a little girl named Teresa Benedict McCarthy, a little Irish girl, and she, uh, she had a terrible, uh, she had a small large amount of what they say, para, Paris month old, but it's a very deadly disease taken, or drug taken in large quantities, and she developed hepatic necrosis, there was no hope for her. And her father, who was a Melchite Catholic, rounded up all the uh, relatives and friends, and they prayed uh, for the intercession of St. Teresa Benedict to the cross, and she was miraculously cured. And that little girl attended her, her canonization. Things that we can learn uh, wonderfully about St. Teresa Benedict to the cross would be the following things. Uh, one is the alert. You learn to what's happening in society through our, a lot of our educational public school systems. It's become the seminaries for very hard wing left. And you gotta really help your children going to college to be ready for this because I've seen this happen uh, to kids to lose their faith, and that's what happened to this wonderful saint. Thank God, God she received the grace to come back from atheism, back to the true faith. But the other thing we can learn from her is that there's an ongoing journey in our life of faith. Huh? Who would have thought this beautiful little girl raised in a large, observant Jewish family would ultimately become a Catholic and a well, atheist, a Catholic, and then a Catholic nun, and then a martyr, and became a saint? It gives us real hope. Uh, no, don't judge yourself by any one point of your life. If you're struggling in area, never give up. God is great, so you just have to keep persevering. It's the number one virtue we need, keep persevering. Another thing we want to do is always be searching for the truth. Uh, you know, never give up never think you've just got it all solved. Keep looking, keep reading, especially keep praying. The best thing to pray about, if you're ever confused, uh, and Bishop Sheen would often say this, if you ever want to uh, find the deep love of God, you don't want to find the sense of sin, you don't want to find what true contrition and sorrow is by a book. He said the book I suggest is not a book book, but the crucifix. And sit in front of it and meditate and it will it will transform your life. And Sister Teresa Benedict of the Cross, St. Peter Stein, would say those things to us. To meditate on the passion of Christ and build a deep sense of what sin really is. The effects of sin, the horror of sin, it'll build within you a deep, deep, deep sorrow for sin, a desire for repentance, and lead you to great conversion. She learned that in her life, and she became that. And also, one last thing I'll say, say that Sister will teach us is that uh, the sufferings of our life, she saw it as that. It was all an attempt to promote the glory of God to seek reparations for our sins and reparations for sins of the world, to seek to advance the kingdom of God. Don't let any sign in your life go by, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual. Always take that to Jesus, ultimately. Now we can, we'll complain about it a little bit, we'll push it more part of our lives, yes, but ultimately take it to Jesus. And uh, <clears throat> if you sit before the cross with your own suffering, they'll start paying in comparison with you see there. <laughs> won't feel so bad when we see what, he, what our sins did. He didn't deserve it. I do. We all do, but he didn't. And it'll give us a sense of hope. Uh, and once we can take that next step, once we can unite our sufferings to that of Christ, there's great power of conversion, not just for us, but for the whole church. And that's what we need to pray for. Uh, that's what we do at every Mass. You know, we're not sitting there in like a potato of few potatoes, just observing some sacred theater up here. You are entering into the one sacrifice of Christ. You 
uniting all that you are to his, particularly our sufferings, for the price of sin, ours and others, for the salvation of the world. One very last thing, continue to pray for our spiritual elder brothers and sisters, the Jewish people. We are spiritual sufferers. We are lucky people to be blessed with the covenant that God established with him that we believe is fulfilled in Jesus and his holy Catholic faith. They don't. Continue to pray for the people of the covenant. We do that every Good Friday in a very special way. We pray for our brothers and sisters, the Jewish people. We pray for them. Uh, because uh, we want them all to know that the Messiah did come. He came for us. He came for them because of the first people of the promise. This great saint offers a lot to us, brothers and sisters. Uh, we're really blessed to have her. Thank God Pope John Paul II canonized her. And don't forget to ask for praises on her behalf. Let us stand.